Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. The, the, the faithful few, meaning that you're coming and, and there's hurricanes, tornadoes, and earthquakes going on outside, and you are here in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. It's quiet. I think the rain's got everybody kind of on the down. Let's uh, look, at, look at your neighbor and smile. If you don't have a neighbor, just smile at yourself. You know, we're in the house of the Lord today. We're blessed. There's such a sweet presence of the Lord in here. You know, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so don't let the storms of life, don't let the storms of reality, when you walk out the door, I, I know there's, there's rain and thunderstorms and winds and tornadoes and stuff like that, that, that you know, they've called for today, but you're here. And the Lord will bless you for that. I, I, I really believe that. Um, we are, we're in part six, um, on the end time. We're talking about the end time, understanding the end time Bible prophecy. And, uh, this has been, been such a, a lot of fun catching up with everything and my studies on all of this and bringing everything to light that's going on today. And, um, so what we're going to be talking about today are things to come. If you go back and you review, and I need to get with the guys back there uh, and post on these titles so that they'll have a better flow to them. But, uh, of course, the first week we unpacked this and we, just, we kind of had some fun with some things. The second week we talked about Israel, God's prophetic time clock, and we traced it all the way back. Uh, from Abraham, uh, the promise to Abraham, um, all the way up until today and its significance. Third week, we, we asked the question, what time is it? And we answered the question, are we living in the time that we'll see the coming of the Lord? And we've learned that with Israel becoming a nation. And there, there is actually a few things that have come to pass biblically uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have seen come to pass that lets us know that we're the generation. And so we answered the question, what time is it? The following week after that, we talked, uh, the title was ready for his return. What do we need to do to be ready for his return? And then last week we talked about love letters to the church, which is Jesus's instruction on how to be ready. And so this will be six weeks starting today. This will be six weeks. I don't know how many more weeks we're going to go. Probably we may go eight to 10 weeks, but I really feel led to do this because there's a lot of people that don't have an inkling of a clue about things that are going on. And um, there's all kinds of messed up understanding out there. And there's room, there's, there's room for some things, and we'll talk about those, uh, you know, on different beliefs, but there's a consistent line of things that are absolute, you know, and those are what we focus on the most. And so today we're going to talk about things to come, and this is where it gets interesting because we've looked at Revelation chapter 1, Revelation 2 and 3. We looked at the, the letters to the churches. And so now starting at Revelation chapter 4, if you're a note taker, this is good because, man, we're going, to, we're going to start at Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to go all, all over the whole entire book of Revelation. But I'm just going to, I'm just going to just kind of a little here and a little there because I'm going to tell you, and this is what, what I'm trying to say. That's what I've been trying to say this whole time. If we were to go 20 weeks on this, we maybe could get some, you know, a pretty good scoop on things. Uh, but we're, we're, we're just scratching the surface. We, we have just, what we've done over the last five weeks, we have just, we're just scratching the surface and we're just hitting the highlights. That's actually what I'm doing through all of this, just hitting the, the highlights. This is pretty amazing. And, and, you know, as we go into this today, you know, as I was studying and I was looking at things and trying to, you know, trying to be current with what's going on, and the stuff I'm going to be telling you today, the stuff that I've told you and I will be telling you through this, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. It, everything fits together. 
If, if you are really hungry for the word of, of God and you begin to read the Bible and you really with an open heart and with a heart of humility and not a preconceived mindset attitude that, you know, I'm going to prove this to be wrong and just, just humble yourself and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to read your word and I'm going to take it for what it is. I'm going to take it literally unless it indicates otherwise. Okay, too many people read into things. Too many people spiritualize and allegorize it and all, they do all kinds of stuff and, you know, make, well, it doesn't really mean that. And the Bible is to be taken literally unless it indicates otherwise. It's that simple. I mean, God didn't make it like some kind of deep hidden mystery. Okay? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and he will reveal things. He will give you more revelation and he will give you greater understanding as you begin to take what he, the, little, the little nuggets that he has given you and the surface thing. There's things that are on the surface. They're, just, they're that easy to understand. You just read them. It don't take a rocket scientist. It doesn't take somebody that has a degree in or a master's degree in theology to, you know, to read it, and it's just crystal clear what it says. It's, it's that easy. And if we would stop making it so difficult and just read it for what it's worth and for what it says, it, things would be a whole lot easier. But we have things that we read, that, well, I just, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. I don't, that just makes me uncomfortable or it makes me angry or it makes me, it just, I, I don't think God would do that or I don't think God would think like that. And so we get these preconceived ideas and then we try to explain away or make excuses or work around them or look for loopholes. And when you find out that, man, everything is laid out and it just, it, it overlaps and it repeats and, and, and it confirms. God confirms his word through his word. The Bible interprets the Bible. And if you just keep reading, you keep reading and you build, it's just like, it's just like line upon line, precept upon precept. Let's build a foundation and let's get the basics and let's just understand what the basics are. And from there on those basics, let's, let's begin to, to build our theology or our understanding of what well, like Pat was talking about. He's talking about on Wednesday nights, he's talking about a biblical worldview uh, and a world. The, the difference between God's worldview or the biblical worldview and the worldview, okay? The biblical worldview is seeing the world through God's lenses, the way God sees things. And the only way we understand how God sees things is through reading his written word that helps us to develop a biblical worldview, Otherwise, we just have what's called a worldview, which is it's how the world sees things. It's how culture, it's how what, whatever's today, the worldview today is very relative. It's, you know, whatever floats your boat kind of a thing. If it feels good, do it. You know, if it, it, it's, it's, it's so secular. It's anti-God, okay? We got to get God out of the equation or we got to get, we least... At least we got to get Jesus and Christianity and the church out of the equation and we can just bring everything else in. And then we'll bring in all of the Jesus and, and churches that agree with everything else. And that becomes that worldview. That becomes what the Bible talks about, you know, the Antichrist system, the beast and the false prophet or the beast, which is the Antichrist. And then there's a false prophet. So there's going to be a religious world leader and there's going to be a political world leader. And these two are going to work together and they're going to just bring peace and harmony and all kinds of, you know, wonderful kitty cats, rainbows and bubbles, and everybody's going to wonder after them. And we're, so we're going to talk about some of this stuff today. But when you read it, it's like, man, that is just amazing. It's, 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 it's incredible how the Bible creates this incredible picture. So I just hope that, I mean, if anything out of all of this, my hope is that it's encouraged you to really get deep in your study and say, that's, that's, this just blows my mind, okay? 
So today, things to come. So remember in the book of Revelation, it started out, you know, John got the, the revelation of Jesus Christ and he was told to write things which were, things which are, and things which were to come. So we've looked at things which were, we've looked at things which are, and now we're looking at things to come. And so starting at Revelation chapter four, from there, we see the vision in Revelation chapter four and one, we see the throne room. It actually goes, you have to, you have to say, okay, what's going on here? Is this on earth or is this going on in heaven when you're reading, all right? And think about it. And, you know, the Bible generally will tell you, the book of Revelation will, will generally, generally tell you that. And so before we read this scripture, well, let's read the scripture and then we're gonna pray. And so we see the Revelation chapter four, the throne room of heaven. A lot of people believe this is the Revelation four, four and one is the rapture. Here's what it says, Revelation 4 and 1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show thee, thing, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So, Lord, just give us insight, give us understanding. Speak to our hearts today, Lord. Let your word penetrate deep into our spirits, so the very innermost being of who we are today, Lord. Convict us, move upon us, shape us and mold us, Lord. Let your will be accomplished in our lives and in this service today, in Jesus' name, amen. So if you're a note taker between Revelation chapter one and three, there's 18 mentions of the word church or churches, okay? But from chapter four on, you don't see the word church anymore. So beginning at chapter four, the church is not mentioned. You don't see the word church anymore. And so 1 Thessalonians tells us that Jesus said, I'm going to rescue you from the wrath or the coming wrath. I did not appoint you to suffer wrath. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians says, I'm going to remove the restraining force. We've learned what the restraining force is. The restraining force is the Holy Spirit that's operating through the church. And when the church is taken out of here, the Holy Spirit is no longer operating through the church because the church is gone. And so that restraining force, that restraining force is what's pushing back the darkness, okay? And so when the prayers of the saints and the, the light of the world, the church being the light of the world, the power and the authority that we have through the Holy Spirit is removed out of here. The restrainers moved out of way. And so what's holding back the darkness is gone. And now it's going to be just full force. Okay. So here's something I want to throw out here for you because I think it's okay to have your beliefs on if it's pre-trib, if it's mid-trib, if it's post, because there, there's some biblical, you know, there's, there's some things that, 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 that hold some weight on, on, on all of those, okay? So we don't make that a heaven or hell issue because it's not, okay? We did not make that a, a deal breaker kind of an issue. There's room to learn, there's room to grow, and there's room to study, and you should always be a student of the word, and you should always be willing to tear down a foundation that you've built if you've realized that, hey, what I've been standing on has not been very correct. It's been a little off, and so I need to go back and rebuild, okay? I, I've really, really, really learned something this year. My wife had this bright idea. She wanted to get a greenhouse from Costco, and it came in two large boxes. Each box was approximately 300 pounds, and it barely fit in the back of a pickup truck. We opened the box and to our surprise, it was a million pieces. And it came with instructions that absolutely, well, that, um, let me like, take that back. They were useless at first. But if you really got into them and you did what they said, they said, read the instructions first and watch the videos. I was like, come on, really? I mean, it's a book and the videos. I mean, there's video after video after video. Who wants to sit there and go through all that? Let's just open the boxes and just go along. And so we did. And we had to go back three times and set the foundation. Three times because it says, first things first, set the foundation. Make sure everything is level and do what it says. Well, come on, it's a small building. We can, we can let some things slide. No, 
No, do not. If you ever get the greenhouse from Costco, do what it says or you're going to be in a mess, okay? So it took me three times. The third time I finally said, okay, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to take my time and I'm going to do it right. And when I got everything level, everything else came together because you can't start putting it together until it's on the foundation. If it's off, if something's off, then as you build it, it's, it's going to be messed up. So you're going to have to go, you're going to have to tear it down and start all over again. It's the same thing when you're building your understanding of Scripture, build on solid foundations. The most important thing first is not that you have your doctrine absolutely correct 100%. The most important thing first is to have your relationship with Jesus correct. But what's important is, is your understanding of Jesus is only given to us through the scripture. So it's important that we read the scripture so that we understand who God is and what his character is and what his attributes is and what, what all, what, how does he think? What does he expect of us? The problem is, is too many people in the world today, just as what, you know, well, me and Jesus, we're close. We're like this. And they don't even know the Bible. And then you know, they get all of these mess, they get all of this messed up thinking, and then they're completely missing things. And, and, and so what, what's happened is they built on a very bad foundation. And when the storms come and the winds blow and the you know realities of life hits, they don't have a foundation. It's just gonna crumble, just like the scripture says. It's only when we build our foundation on Christ Jesus, who was God manifested in the flesh, whom all power was given unto him after he rose from the grave. He said, all power is given unto me and that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God. He wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just some great teacher. He's God manifested in the flesh. So it's important that we understand the deity of Christ and that Jesus said the only way to the Father is that through him. So these are solid foundations. These are some things that you can build from, from that. And then from there, you start building. And so wherever you are when it comes to uh, other things that are they're important, but they're not important, they're not, they're not salvific. That's a theological word. It's not a matter of salvation. Okay, Arminianism, Calvinism. Were you predestined or do you have a choice? That's what that means. Uh, post, mid, pre-trib, millennial, amillennialism, millennialism, all of that stuff, it's, it's, it's important to know, but you have room. Are you with me today? So the belief in the pre-trib rapture is actually... I submit to you is the most difficult position out of all of the others to believe because it requires you to be ready. Think about it for a minute. There's gonna be a very, or there are going to be very predictable events during the tribulation that will allow you to get yourself ready. It will fall into a definite calendar. And we're gonna look at that as we go. Whereas the pre-trib rapture, you just gotta be ready. You gotta be ready. The tribulation, again, is the seven year period. And Blair, if you wanna put that, if you wanna put that up there and maybe kind of dim these lights up here a little bit so that everybody can see, you can take snapshots of this. I have something. Uh, should be pretty clear. I, I'm really excited about this laser projector because used to, if you look back there on the back wall, that's what we used to be looking at. It's a little blurry, but now you can see it. It's kind of all laid out. Then you can, you can take a snapshot of that with your phone. I wish I had a laser pointer. Does anybody have a laser pointer by chance? You got one? Is it on your pocket, Rachel? Oh, well, it doesn't help me any. <laughs> but thank you anyway. Yeah, bring it next time. Because, yeah, I'll try to bring one too. I don't know. But, well, let's just take a look at this just real quick, and I'll kind of break this down. Where do we start? Where do we start? So we're in the church age right now. So look at this start at the very beginning. The church age started at the, on the day of Pentecost. Technically, at the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, Jesus sent back the Holy Spirit or the Comforter on the day of Pentecost. That was the birth of the church. So that puts us in the church age. So that we've been in the church age for over 2,000 years. The church looks back to what Jesus did on the cross, right? 
All right, we're in the age of grace. That's the church age. So we're getting close to what's called the catching away or the rapture of the church. Some people put, you see the blue right there? That's the seven-year tribulation period that we've been talking about. If you see where the rapture of the church, the most acceptable or the most accepted, widely accepted view is that the rapture takes place right there. And then that begins the seven-year period. There's a peace treaty that takes place. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? There's going to be a peace treaty that's going to happen with Israel and the Palestines, the Palestinians. Some people believe that there's going to be like, uh, where you can be at like a two-state Palestinian and Israel. They can all live together in, in, in perfect harmony and you know, they can have the dome of the rock and they can have the temple all side by side and everything's just going to be kitty cats, rainbows and bubbles. But there's going to be a, there's going to be a peace treaty. So that's something that we're looking for. We've seen some of these things happen throughout the years. There have been peace agreements that's been made, but then all of a sudden, you know, things just fall apart. Obviously, we've seen this year things have fallen apart with any of those peace accords or any of those agreements that have been made. There's the seals, there's the trumpets that's happening during the tribulation. That treaty is going to be broken, that peace treaty in the middle of the tribulation. During this scene right here that we're looking on earth, there's things that are going on up in heaven during that period. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Then there's the second coming of Christ. So you can put the rapture of the church at the beginning. You can, some people put it in the middle and some people put the rapture. right there. And there's all kinds of cool stuff. You can't make this up. When you start to study and you see how everything fits together, it will blow your mind. There are types, there are shadows, there are patterns all throughout the whole entire Bible that points toward all of these things that are happening. It's incredible. And so when we look at the tribulation, this seven years, it begins with the Antichrist signing a peace treaty or a pact with the nation of Israel. This Antichrist, he's going to He's going to look like a hero. He's going to have all of the answers to all of the world's problems. And he's going to have all the right answers. And three and a half years into the tribulation, in Daniel chapter 9, it talks about this. I'm going to break all of this stuff down. I'm going to show you where it talks about everything that I'm teaching you today. Daniel chapter 9 gives us a lot of information about this. Now let's go on into Revelation 6, and we're going to jump around the whole book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 6 through 19, the vast majority of Revelation is all about the seven-year period called the tribulation, and this part is one of the most difficult parts of the Bible to understand because it's filled with a lot of symbolism, okay? Remember this, though, that God is showing John things in our time, which is 2,000 years, over 2,000 years later, Okay? So you want to talk about a cultural gap. You want to talk about John seeing some things from his time, looking in, looking down through the scope in our timeline. Think about this one. Put yourself in John's shoes and try to explain tanks, F-16 fighter jets, Apache attack helicopters, B-52 bombers, stealth bombers, droids, or droids. I'm sure there's droids. Drones. I just saw we were on the base at Fort Campbell a couple weeks, a couple Saturdays ago, and they did a drone show, and it literally blew my mind. I was like, that is incredible. That is incredible. That is incredible. It's amazing how accurately they're going to be able to kill people or that they can kill people, you know, <laughs> because, I mean, these things, it was like fireworks. There was like, you know, hundreds of drones, and they were like making helicopters and army men and American flags and, you know, the symbols that, the, you know, 
know, that the military uses, and, and then they would move. The helicopter would move, and the propellers were moving on. These were drones doing that. And it gave me goosebumps. I was like, that's incredible. And so John was seeing these things. John, God was showing John things that were going to happen in the last days. Nuclear missiles, it talks about stars falling from the sky. It talks about, you know, meteors or asteroids and comets and things like that or whatever. But, our, our, you know, you think about it, it wasn't just too long ago that our grandparents and great-grandparents remember when planes were invented, cars and TV, microwave ovens. I remember I was a kid kid when we got our first microwave oven and my mom would always say, don't stand in front of the microwave. You know, I mean, have you ever heard that before? You know, and all, all of this stuff, I mean, the TV that we had, it just had one button on it, you know, well, two, you could turn it on and off and then change the channels one through 13. When it got through 13, it went back around again. That wasn't that long ago. Now I'm real. Let's, let's, let's get live in your living room. The iPhone is not that old. 2008, 2009, around 2010s when people started getting them. Everybody started getting smartphones. It's not that long ago. This stuff is new to our age. The seven-year tribulation period ends with the second coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, again, this is a great event that is, it's not a come up, but a come down, Okay. So the rapture is not the second coming. The catching away is not the second coming. It's a come up here, okay? The second coming is when Christ returns and he touches down. Let's take a look at Revelation 19, 11 through 14. It says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat up on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire and it, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And verse 19, it says, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat up on the horse and against his army. Like, wow. So God is going to defeat the enemy when he returns at this great battle called Armageddon, the corrupt and wicked system, the beast system, the antichrist, the false prophet, and all who oppose him, the Bible says, will be cast alive into the lake of fire and burning with brimstone. Satan will be bound at this time. He will be locked up in a prison compartment in the earth for a thousand years. Can you put that back up there again? And God will set up his millennium. So at the end, there's the battle of Armageddon. Once things are set, and Jesus sets up his throne, Satan will be bound for a thousand years and there will be a thousand year millennial reign. Okay? I know that's deep. And the bride will be with him, the bride of Christ, which is the church. Like, let's step out. Can we step, can we go down a rabbit hole a little bit? Because you know there's gonna be, it's not just about the bride, even though the bride is kind of the apple of God's eye. But there's, there's a lot more to There are going to be other people that's going to be at the wedding supper. There are going to be people that's still going to be living on the earth during the time that the millennial reign comes, that comes, comes and, you know, the new Jerusalem is here. And there's still going to be things that's going to be going on for, for a whole nother thousand years. All right. And then after all of that's said and done, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you because some of you may not be here to hear the rest of that. But... Satan's going to be loose for a little while, okay? And then once and for all, everything's going to be set the way God intended. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And this is where I think a lot of people, you know, kind of see that there are some beliefs, <coughs> excuse me, that believe that, you know, when you die, you're going to rule your own planet or your own solar system. Right? I've, that's... Stuff is not even, the Bible doesn't talk about that. You know, you, you can dream, you can think about things and you can ooh and ah all you want to. <clears throat> but there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It says that God will renovate things. He's gonna make it new. And so we're still gonna be on the earth 
We're not going to be floating on a cloud somewhere with a halo playing a harp, you know, for all eternity. So, yeah, I know it's pretty deep. A lot of people don't think out that far. I don't know what, there's, there's a lot of things that, there's some things that we can get into, and I will share some things with you that I'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> well, we won't know. We won't know a lot of this stuff until we get there, you know. But that's what's so amazing. Remember, we see through a glass darkly. We know in part, and we see in part. Thank you, Blair. And so God is going to defeat the enemy at the Battle of Armageddon. He's going to set up his kingdom a thousand years, and God will, uh, God will reign for that 1,000 years. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on past that timeline where we're at. And Revelation 19 and 7 talks about there's something that we have to look forward to. So it says this, it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage supper or the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Who is the wife? It's the church, it's the bride. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he says, uh, he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And so what's interesting here is that John's vision in Revelation pictures, he pictures a wedding feast of the lamb, which the lamb is Jesus and his bride is the church. And this is actually can I go a little bit deep right here? This is a third, what we would call a third phase. You see, the implication is that there's two, there's three phases. The first two phases will have already taken place. The first phase was this. If you catch this, this is really cool. The first phase was complete on earth when each individual believer placed his or her faith in Christ as their savior, okay? That is according to Jewish wedding Customs, the dowry paid by the bridegroom's parents, which is God the Father, would be the blood of Christ shed on the bride's behalf. So the church on earth today then is what we would call betrothed to Christ. And like the wise virgins that we read about in the parables, all believers should be watching and waiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. <laughs> Some of you are like, that's so awesome. That just blows my mind. And you're getting like Holy Ghost goosebumps. And some of you are like, I don't get it. I don't get it because there's, there's parables and there's some deep things that are happening here. And it's so amazing how God works through patterns and he works through his people and he showed us these things. He showed us these things and he's given us patterns and he's given us types and he spelled it out. The second phase is it's a symbolism of the rapture of the church. You see, when Christ comes to claim his bride and to take her to the father's house, the marriage supper then follows as the third and final step. Okay. And so it's our, our, it's our belief and it's kind of a majority of belief that the marriage supper of the lamb takes place in heaven between the rapture and the second coming during the tribulation period on earth. So while all of that stuff that's going on in the blue, the, the tribulation period, the marriage supper of the lamb's going on in heaven. So you see the scene go as you read the book of Revelation. It's on earth and you're seeing all of these seals and these bows and, and, and you know, all of, this, all of these judgments are taking place. But in heaven, we're seeing some things. There's a scene that go, goes back and forth. And so attending the wedding feast will not only be the church, as the bride of Christ, but others, there will be other people there as well. The others include the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints are gonna be there and they will not have been resurrected yet, supposedly, but their souls or their spirits, you know, will be in heaven with us. And so as the angel told John to write in Revelation 19 and nine, it says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Blessed are those, that's the others that will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come on. So, man, I've, have I lost you all or y'all? 
Clap your hands if you're with me. <laughs> Come on. I mean, it's like, it's like quiet in here today. This is good. So, yeah, blessed are they. The marriage supper of the Lamb is a glorious celebration of all who are in Christ Jesus. And so the first thing that is going to take place when all is settled is a celebration. You see, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be wed with Christ as the bride. And, you know, there's no buffet in this world ain't got nothing on the buffet in heaven. Imagine a thousand year period where we're gonna be with Jesus on earth. And this is where the judgment seat of Christ takes place. If you're a note taker, this can be something that you can write down. There's what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And then there's a great white throne judgment, okay? The judgment seat of Christ, also known as Bema, that's the Greek word, it takes place when what happens here is that we're going to receive gifts or rewards based upon the good works that we did for the kingdom while on earth. It, this is not the same thing as the great white throne judgment. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Another big misconception is that we're going to spend eternity in heaven. I'm going to let that simmer in your crock pot for a little bit. We're going to spend the first thousand years on earth and Jesus is going to reign out of Jerusalem. <laughs> Y'all are like, wow. It will be like it was in the Garden of Eden. No sin, no pollution, no insurance, no traffic. <laughs> the Krispy Kreme light will always be on. What a day that will be. I had to say it. I had to say it. I always have to say it. But so when the thousand years, I'm just having fun right there. Y'all are with me, right? You know, that's not Bible, the Krispy Kreme light. But I just, I believe, I believe that's going to, I believe it's going to be there. And you can eat all the goodies and candy bars and sweets and ice cream and all that that you want because you're going to be an immortal glorified body and you don't have to worry about it, you know, jacking up your numbers and all that stuff. All right, let's get back on track. And so when the thousand years is up, God is going to release Satan for a short time. I'm not 100% sure why. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people have their theories. You know, but the scripture does tell us that it is to deceive the nations one more time, and he will be dealt with once and for all after this. So, that's, you know, it's like, why? If, if, if you know, all of this happens and, you know, Jesus restores, like, why would he let this dude out again? You know, there's a reason for it. And there's, you know, there's some theories, but he knows God, he's God. He knows what he's doing, right? But once and for a while, he will be thrown into the lake of fire, which was prepared for him, which brings us to the next event. We talked about the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. This next event, after the thousand years, Satan's been loosed for a while. Then we get into the great white throne judgment, okay? This great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, 11 uh, through 15, here's what it says. This is what John saw. He says, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat up on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in those books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the death which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So hell and the lake of fire are two different things, okay? Uh, death, hell, and the grave, we see that this death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And so the final judgment prior to the lost being cast into the lake of fire, we know from Revelation chapter 20 that this judgment will take place after the millennial reign and after Satan is thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet will have already been for a thousand years. The books were open, the Bible says, in, in Revelation chapter 20, and it contains records of everyone's deeds, whether they're good or evil, because see, God knows, we know that he knows everything. He's omniscient is what the Bible, 
you know, alludes to, lets us know he's all knowing. He, he knows everything that's ever been said, done, or even thought, and he will reward or punish each one accordingly. Step out of here on a limb a little bit. Okay. I've got good footing right here. Just as there are going to be degrees of punishment at the great white throne judgment, there will be degrees of punishment on the other end of the spectrum. So both ends of God is righteous and just in his judgment. And whatever decisions he makes, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things. He is the creator of all things. Why do we try to put our mind in God's mind, like I know how God would think and I just don't see how God could do this or why God would do that. He's, the, he's righteous, he's faithful, he's just. He's smarter than we are. All of us put together, every person that's ever existed, you make one ginormous brain and he's still smarter. But we have this tendency to put God in our own spectrum. I just know what God would think, or I just don't know how God could do that. He's God. <laughs> he knows better, and he, he will make the right decisions. I promise you that. I promise you that. We mess up. We, we get accused whenever we judge somebody or we don't judge somebody. You know, we get accused if we make a decision or if we don't make a decision. But he, he will be righteous. He will be the righteous judge. So the books were open. They contain records of everyone's deeds. It's also at this time, another book is open. It's called the book of life, Revelation 20 and 12. And it's this book that determines whether a person will inherit eternal life with God or receive everlasting punishment in the lake of fire. See, as a Christian, we're held accountable for our actions, we are forgiven in Christ. And the Bible says that our names are written in the book of life from the creation of the world. We also know that from the scripture that this is a judgment when the dead will be judged according to what they had done, okay? And that anyone's name that was not found in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what it says, Revelation 12 or Revelation 20 and 15. The fact that there is going to be a final judgment for all people, both believers and unbelievers, is clearly confirmed in many, many passages in the Bible. This is where it gets a little, like for me, I, 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 I'm not clear if the bride is part of this, okay? Because it doesn't make sense if the catching away and the marriage supper of the lamb and the judgment seat of Christ, we've already, we made it. Are you with me? Yeah. We're there. Why would we stand before the great white throne judgment and then be rejudged? So that's just something I haven't, I haven't clearly put together yet. You know, I mean, I've been thinking too much. You know, obviously y'all are hearing me, but I don't know. It's just something to think about. I don't know how that's going to work. Maybe because there's going to be, you know, there will still be people living on the earth and life will still go on and, you know, during the millennial reign and, you know, so there's going to be that thousand years and then, you know, uh, that great white throne judgment. Maybe that's those, maybe, maybe it's those people. I don't know if somebody knows, you can let me in on it. You know, uh, I haven't really heard anybody talk about that because that's way on down the line. What we need to be worried about is now. Okay. That's fun stuff to think about and that's fun stuff to, you know, to kind of poke around at and try to guess and have some, have some fun with it. But the truth is there's a lot of stuff that we're not going to know until we get there. Are you with me? It says this, every person will one day stand before God and be judged for his or her deeds, period. Every person, Okay. While it is very clear that the great white throne judgment is a final judgment, Jesus will be the judge. All unbelievers will be judged by Christ and they will be punished according to the works that they have done. So the Bible is crystal clear that unbelievers are storing up wrath against themselves. Look at Romans 2 and 5. Uh, Blair, if you could put that up there. And God will repay each person according to what they have done. 
Uh, actually, two and five through six. Yeah, that would be a good scripture to look at. But see, this is a judgment to determine who goes to heaven or who goes to hell. And so we got to make sure that we understand this. It's not a works judgment. See, he's not going to ask you about your church attendance here. He's not going to ask you about your denomination affiliation here. He's not going to ask you how much you gave or how much you served. This is a prepare for the final exam. There's only going to be one question. What did you do with my son? What did you do with my word? The son is the word made flesh. What did you do with what you, were, what you know that you were supposed to do? And our answer as the church should be, I loved him. He was my Lord and he was my friend, or he is. And then it brings us to the new heaven and the, and the new earth. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna sing in a choir for the next billion years. It'd be cool for a little while, but I think after a little, after a while, I'd probably get old. Anything would be better, you know, than being in hell. I'd sing it in a choir for a billion years. I don't know. It could be hell for some people. I don't know. But the truth is, is you're actually going to be appointed cities. There's going to be, there's still a stewardship. Did you know this is a whole, let's, let's go out here. Let's go in another rabbit hole. The stewardship that you're entrusted with in this world right now will determine the stewardship that you're entrusted with when you get to the new Jerusalem. Never thought about that, did we? A lot of us don't think about that stuff. Everything we have belongs to God. God has given it to us to steward or to manage. What are you going to do with what you have right now so that when you get to the other side, you'll still be doing things like that? You can't make this stuff up. (laughs) Most of the world would hear this stuff and literally think we have lost our minds as the church. And a lot of the world thinks that the church, church people are kooky. And that's okay. That's okay. But because see, when you begin to study and you begin to read and you begin to see the perfection of the handwriting of God, literally the finger of God at work in in his handiwork, in his word and in his world, in this universe, it will stagger your imagination. So it talks about the new heaven and and the new earth. The truth is this, you're actually gonna be appointed to cities and you're going to rule and reign. That's what the scripture says. We're going to rule and reign. There's a scripture that's, that's been kind of misunderstood. It says that we would be kings and priests. There's only one king, and that's Jesus. We're not going to be kings with King Jesus. We're going to be rulers with Jesus. So that's what that literally means. That word king, kings and priests will be rulers and priests with Jesus. Thought I'd clear that up too. And this is, this is where it really gets so awesome. Heaven is gonna be so much greater than anything we could imagine. First Corinthians two and nine says this, that it is written that no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And so we get a, we get a little bit of the vision right here in Revelation chapter 21, 10, and all the way into Revelation 22. Beginning 21, chapter 21 and verse 10, it says, this is the glimpse of heaven. It says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal, as she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and the 12 angels at the gates and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel and the three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. And he 
who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is, a great, is as great as its breadth and it's measured and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. And then he measured its walls, 142 cubits, according to the measure of man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its walls was jasper and gold, pure gold, clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, and the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx and sardis and that one and that one and, and the eighth was beryl and I can't even pronounce some of these uh, uh, topaz and and that one and the eleventh jacinth and the twelfth amethyst the twelfth the twelve gates of the twelve uh, were twelve pearls and each individual gate was one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And then it talks about the glory of the new Jerusalem in, in verse 22. It says, but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty, the lamb or its temple and the city had no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God illuminated it and the lamb is its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there and there shall, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a life, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And it talks about the lake of fire, Revelation 21, 8. It says, and he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the foundation of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable, murderer, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, Adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, this lake of fire is a term that's used in only a few verses near the end of the book of Revelation. Jesus actually refers to what's called Gehenna or hell several times in Matthew and Mark, as well as in outer darkness. Jesus used the term Outer, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He talks about outer darkness. These all seem to be different references, though, of the same thing. You hear about uh, Abraham's bosom. You hear, you know, you hear about, you know, uh, Lazarus as he was in hell, and you know, he said, "If I could just go back, if you could just let me go back and, and warn all my friends." And you know, and they were told, "If you can't," he was told, "If you can't, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, how are they going to listen to you?" These seem to be different references of the same thing. Hell, the lake of fire, outer darkness are all terms describing the final destination of those who reject Christ. Whatever you believe here, there's, there's no point in even arguing. People, most people believe in a literal hell, literal, literal interpretation of, of a place called hell, a literal lake of fire. Some people believe it to be allegorical. Some people believe it just to be symbolic. Some people believe that it talks about, you know, spending an eternity in hell, which is never ending burning. It's like, how could a God of love send somebody there and let them burn for eternity over and over and over and over and over? And so a lot of those people generally come to the conclusion that eternal means a different word. It means that when it is finished, 
So that means it will be burned up. So those people that were cast into the lake of fire, that they will literally be burned up. Can I just say this? I don't care what you believe about hell. It's going to be worse than the Bible describes it. And heaven is going to be greater than what the Bible can describe and what we can comprehend. So what's the point of even arguing? I mean, does it make you feel more comfortable that if you kind of slip up and you go to hell that you're just going to burn up and not exist anymore? Why would you want to do that? Why would you even want to argue? It's just, our eternity is nothing to take lightly. And, you know, we have the joys and the blessings of the Lord and we have all of the benefits that comes with the kingdom of God and all of the promises that God has given us and they're yay and amen. And, you know, I mean, we're told things like to love your neighbor as, you know, as you love yourself, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength and that there's, you know, there's peace that passes all understanding. And why would somebody argue against that? Why would somebody say, no, it's not good to love your neighbor as you love yourself? And then that gets into, that opens up a whole nother can of worms. You know, because the world now sees love as tolerance and accepting everything, all kinds of wickedness and perversion and darkness is celebrated. The, the, the Bible does tell us that in the last days, good will be called evil and evil will be called good and that the scales of justice will be turned upside down. And the scripture says, woe to those who, who, who cause such things that way. Paraphrase it, but you get the point. I mean, we prayed sin and we celebrate sin and we try to do what's right and we do things according to the scripture and People make fun of you and persecute you and laugh at you and mock you. And that's okay. That's okay because that's what we're promised. See, Christians are promised, which says that Jesus said, you will be hated for my name's sake. You will be persecuted. And so we think it's strange when, you know, somebody offends us or somebody does something to us that hurts our feelings. My God, my God, my God. There are people that are being, I mean, they're being executed because of their belief in Christ. They're being executed just because they go to church and they go in and they arrest them all and they throw them in prison and they beat them and they kill them, they torture them. Even the children today, now, I was just reading in Haiti, there was a young missionary couple, they were in their early 20s, cute kids. They were just murdered for no reason because they were Christians. And then we, we get offended over Facebook, my God. We get offended if somebody doesn't take our side of things or see things the way that we see it or or believe the same way we believe. My God, my God. (sighs) Innocent kids, early 20s, a gang in Haiti, they just killed them. This happens everywhere all of the time. It should put things into perspective for us. We are blessed. The United States of America is blessed, but its blessing is becoming its curse. And our arrogance and our self-centeredness is gonna be our downfall, our pride. It's all about me and how I feel. Hmm. I hope this is okay. I mean, it is okay, whether well, you know you like it or not. It's just you know. I mean, it's just what it's what it says, you know. So as we wrap up here, shall we stand? When the church is persecuted, when you go through darkness and your faith is tried, that's when it comes to life. That's when the power, the authority, and the anointing. Did you know when churches are persecuted? That's when it gets real. 
what happens is that we've become so comfortable in our comfort zones and our status quo in our churches in America. We don't know what it's like to risk our lives to go to a church service or to be found with a Bible in like what they call the 1040 window, if that's even still a thing, because that 1040 window has grown into a larger window as time goes by. I mean, what that means is those are like nations and areas that is very hostile towards Christianity. We've gotten into this Western way of thinking, of comfort, commercialism, self-centeredness, consumer mentality, microwave society, Burger King have it your way mindset. Why does revival fires burn so much brighter in foreign countries and third world countries? Because when they find Jesus, they realize that's all they have and they give it 100%. And there's a lot of people in the American church that's gonna wake up and they're gonna be surprised. Because they've been playing church. Oh, come on, come on. That's not the way we think. I mean, come on, really? This is this this is the woke church. This is the the liberal mindset of the church today is that everybody's going to go to heaven ever. It's universal. Everybody's going to go to heaven. Everything's going to be okay. There is no hell. There is no judgment. (laughs) Okay. I'm just going to pick and choose what I want. Then I'm going to, I'm going to paint my own picture of what I like because that's what we do. That's what we're good at. I don't agree with that. And so we, we get rocked to sleep with this mentality. You're comfortable. It's okay. It's all good. It's okay. It's all good. You're going to be fine. You just believe whatever you want to believe. And then we're going to wake up and we're going to have a rude awakening. And where people are gonna stand before you and they're gonna go before God and they're gonna hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, you good and faithful servant, enter in. And then you're gonna stand before God and you're gonna gonna hear, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. That's hard. That's just hard. It's not, oh, come on. Uh, give Give me a comfort zone. Give me a safe space, Jesus. That's not fair. I've done the best that I could. But you've never received me as your savior. You've never put your faith. You've never walked this out. You've given it lip service and you've played the part and you've been an imposter all along. That should stir us up and make us wanna repent. That should stir us up and make us wanna get on our knees. But there are people that will listen to this sermon and they will come right up against it, that go to church, that are in mainstream evangelical churches now, and it will put me down as a false teacher because I'm telling you things right from the Bible. And I don't care. And over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be talking about things that's probably gonna get us canceled. So we may just turn the camera off, I don't know. Maybe we can just go ahead and turn it on and just get canceled, and, you know, but I wanna reach people out there with these words. But man, we've got church, we've gotta get back to, 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 to what's righteous and what's true and what's real and quit pampering everybody for God's sakes. So here's, as we close right here on this part, this state of, of separation from God is what, what it's talking about in hell. As scripture indicates that every person whose name was not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire will also be the fate of the beast and the false prophet at the end times and Satan himself, Revelation 20. The Bible indicates that both death and Hades or grave, death and hell 
or the temporary destination of the unsaved dead, but also will be, those will be cast into the lake of fire, okay? Here's the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It's not like God says, I'm gonna create a place and I'm gonna send the people who don't like me or don't choose me. He created for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25 and 41 says, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And Revelation 20 and 10 through 15 says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown and they were they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And check this out. And then I saw a great white throne of him who sat upon it and the earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for, for them. You know, I think it's so crazy because like people during the tribulation period will curse God. There will still be people that will see all of this and beyond a shadow of a doubt, they're gonna see that God is doing this and they're gonna curse God and they're not gonna repent. And it says that when the Lord comes that they're gonna make war with the lamb. That we already know how all this is gonna end up. I gotta stop, I gotta stop. But man, you know, let's, let's stop before I get on another tangent. But they're using stuff right now to prepare you. They're using stuff. I'll just say that and I'm gonna move on. You can ask me about it later. But the fact that the destiny of those who reject God is described as a lake of fire speaks of how serious that judgment is. Don't play with it. And so as I close right here, I want us to know this. I want us to understand God is not mad. The whole motivation of Christianity, the whole motivation of sending his son, the whole motivation of Jesus himself is that he wants to get married. He wants to have a bride. He wants to have a relationship. He wants love. He wants us to love him. Do we, do we see that? Do we understand that? It's not like he created a bunch of robots and said, they're gonna do what I say or I'm gonna step on, I'm gonna stomp them out like a bunch of little ants. No, it's not good for God to be alone. And so he created us in his image. And so he just wants us to recognize him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to reach out to our maker. That's why he calls the church the bride of Christ. He is coming to find his bride and he wants to be with you and I. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Steve, just begin to sing and let's just respond to that. Let's let that, whatever God's speaking, what the Holy Spirit is doing in you right now, just talk to the Lord and worship him and thank him. And if you need him, just cry out to him. Say, God, I need you today. I, I understand. It's, I need to change. I need you to work in my life. Whatever you need to do, this altar is open. It's always open for prayer. And I'd be glad to pray with you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May 
the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. Oh, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. What are we waiting on, guys? Are you waiting on Steve to come up here and say some? some exciting words? Are you waiting for somebody to come and, and entertain us? What, what are we doing? Like pastor just preached a word that, man, there was so much weight on that. There was, and, and, and it just went right over some of our heads. Why can't we just lay down this haughtiness? Why can't we get rid of this callousness? There's clearly a spirit of repentance coming in this place. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to put you down. I'm just trying to bring light to it. What are we waiting on? Why, why does it take so much gnashing of teeth for us to come and lay it down before the Lord? What are we waiting on? Like, this is such a, such a blessed time that we have to be able to come in like this under these circumstances. There is coming a time soon where it's not going to be like this. You, you will be lucky if you can make it to the doors of this place. And if we do make it in, we will probably be lucky if there aren't people outside trying to get in to get us out of this place. We are in such a blessed time, and I don't know what we're waiting on. I don't know what it's going to take. What are we doing? Lord Jesus, forgive us. God, forgive us of our haughtiness. Lord, I pray that you would rid us of this callousness. Lord Jesus, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that we would come to your altars. Father, that we would lay down our arrogance, Lord, that we would that we would lay down our offenses. Father God, that we would just come together as one body. Father, that we would realize how blessed we are. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Isn't it interesting that God chose a day where like literally over half of the church wouldn't be here because of storms and stuff like that? To preach a sermon like this, you know? And I'm not saying that this, you're, you know, you're the special remnant or anything like that. I, I just, you know, I think the enemy, the enemy kept people away. The enemy definitely kept people away from hearing a powerful word today. It's not out of fear that we worship God. It's out of love. But, the, you know, the scripture does say that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. But that fear is just a reverence to him. We, I, I, you know, I honor him. I respect him for who he is. He's daddy, you know, if that makes sense. It's Abba, Abba Father. We cry Abba Father. It's like saying daddy. I don't know. I mean, Abba Father, you know, kind of puts the, the comfort there, you know, but there's, there's also the other side of things. And that's, I think sometimes we, we like to not, and it's not so much me. I mean, it's, you, you can tell when something's in the right spirit and the right attitude. Cause I've heard, I've been to revivals and I've heard preachers before. That's like, you're going to get what you deserve. You know, it's just, just like terrible. It's like, I could just feel it, man. I, I wouldn't even want to, wouldn't even want to be, I don't even, it just, it's, you have the wrong motive if you're preaching from that angle that you're going to get what you deserve. Bless God. That is wrong. That's not, that's not God. That's not the right, that's not the right picture of God. That's a religious spirit of God, that a religious mindset that's brought on by a religious spirit. It's probably the more correct way, you know, to put that. But just as he is the God of grace and mercy and love and justice and all of, all of that stuff, he's also a God of wrath. It's just that, that he is a God of judgment. He is a God. There's pl- times in the scripture where God is angry, you know. He's not bipolar. He's perfect in in all of his ways. And if we can just get that, and if we begin to read the scriptures and understand that, it really really help you a whole lot to help you get the right view of God. So many of us have a messed up view of God. And that's that's a lie from the enemy. If you have a wrong view of God, then you're you're not serving the right God. Y'all with me? So it's important that we get that right. So Father, we thank you for your word today. I know it's, it's been a little longer than usual, but hey, it's, it's, it, today's the day to do it, right? In Jesus' name, Lord, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed.